Come on up, everybody. Come on up. I know you're all in front of me. Next topic is data and privacy in Web3, topic that I'm very, very curious about myself. So I'm very honored to be moderating this panel. Come on up. <laughs> no? No, I hear. All right, grab a chair, everybody. Let's get right into it. We need probably an extra room. Uh, don't take this one. I'll take this one. Y'all sit there. You guys can go. Two mics, please. Two mics. Or three mics. All right, we got water. All right, let's get into it. Um, just you have to turn your mics on. Feel free. This is an open conversation. And uh, we're just going to go from the end, just introducing yourselves real quick and get into the conversation. Uh, Ronaldo, please introduce yourself to the audience. Oh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. My name is Rolando Subiran. I am currently the global head for Web3 and Metaverse Services for R. Donnelly & Sons, which is a global Fortune 500 business communications company. It's a pleasure. Nice. Melanie? Hello, I'm Melanie Moore. I'm the founder and CEO of One Protocol, which is a infrastructure technology for the marketing segment, uh, social fi, and therefore privacy is very important as we are bringing on board a lot of the users now from social Web3 spaces. Uh, hi, my name is Ingo. I'm the founder of Kilt Protocol. Kilt Protocol uh, does decentralized identity in the Web3. Uh, we're part of the Polkadot ecosystem, if you heard of that. Um, yeah, thanks for inviting me. Bruce Pawn uh, with Ocean Protocol. We're tooling and infrastructure orchestration for the data economy. We're deployed on six different networks right now. Uh, yeah, and we've been at this since uh, 2013, 2014. Which is like forever in our world. Um, all right, so kind of, I'm going to set this up with um, just kind of a point of view. So. Web3 as an ethos is about like you know, open, uh, it, it's about decentralization, it's about uh, like anonymity, like you don't know who people are, but yet like having everything connected together is what powers like the, the chain almost, like every, the provenance is so clear, who, who the transferring of, of assets between one to the next. So I guess my first question to the audience, or not the audience, to, to the panel is like, what's like, the, the, the like North Star problem that you're trying to address through your companies? Anybody, just start, we'll start here. So, so one of the things that we've seen is that, uh, you know, the world's changing very, very fast. And the, the heart of where, where our company came from was to see that every one of you in this room and around the world has got a, a great education and has some sort of ideas. And the, and the question is, can you monetize that? And if you can do that, if you could find a way using somehow tokens, Web3, all that sort of stuff to create kind of value in intellectual property and data, that everybody has a chance in a world with AI, robotics, and automation. And so we set about uh, building some uh, smart contracts, protocol, and tools to help people financialize and monetize their intellectual property and data. And that's with them Revealing their identity, keeping their anonymity, like. So it's uh, it's all about actually giving people a choice. Okay, cool. Yeah, go on. So on identity, uh, so identity is something that somehow everyone has, right? And this is also something that we all know from the physical world. So we do have faces, which we now call identifiers. We do have fingerprints. We can do signatures. We know that those things are private to us, right? They were not given to us by a company or a government or so. It's my face. And uh, then we also know those credentials, which are given to us by universities, by countries, uh, by the public library, which is the passports, uh, uh, college degrees, whatever. And they all link to those um, identifiers. And uh, uh, there are systems around that that we call identity transactions, which are actually in the physical world very privacy preserving. When I go somewhere and use my passport, the issuer of the passport will not find out that I used it. So that's, that's pretty private, right? And I also hold them all in my wallet, which is totally private and, and self-sovereign. And then came the internet. And in the internet, actually, everything was centralized to a couple of platforms like Facebook and so on, where my identifiers and all my credentials are actually sitting in a database which I do not control. So in the way to digitization, we actually lost power 
as people. And what Web3 is doing, and especially what we're doing in this, uh, in this field of identity, is bring the power back to the people. So we basically emulate the system that we had in the physical world into the digital world. You are now able to actually create your own identifiers on your computer and privately decide who you share your credentials with because you also hold them on your computer. This is, and the infrastructure for that is what we implemented in Kit. Interesting. I'm gonna come back to you all now and go ahead, Melanie. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the, the issues that uh, we currently see is because our products are already out in the wild. We have already integrated our protocol in three social apps. We see user onboarding and their hurdles and challenges every day. And obviously it's the, you know, the basics, especially when you're in Socialify, when you're dealing with uh, creators, uh, with people who are watching content, engaging in content. We have play to, uh, we have uh, create to earn, we have rate to earn in our system. So the basic questions and issues are always, what is a wallet? What is crypto? Why do I earn crypto? Why is it fluctuating? And I think there is still this, you know, uh, whole educational path that we are, um, yeah, trying to bring to our users, but that the Web3 space anyway has to face. And uh, especially when it's also about identifiers, the question will be, um, how easy is the UI UX to understand for people? Because we know we got so lazy, we are always accepting the terms and conditions uh, for the convenience in an easy onboarding uh, service. And so for me, the biggest question about privacy is uh, how do we solve it also on a UX and UI level? No, uh, thank you very much. From, well, from this side, it's much more of a Web2 kind of approach to a Web3 ethos. No, Because at the end of the day, when we talk about Web3, we're talking about this, this covenants of decentralization and owning your data and doing things differently. But when we approach it from a marketing perspective and looking at global brands, how they're approaching the sector, we're all talking about consumers, right? And at the end of the day, consumers just want, most of the consumers just want to be along for the ride. They want to be told beautiful stories. They want to engage with beautiful content. And if that technology helps and it makes their life easier, then it's a great solution for them, right? And I think we have a lot of tools that address also privacy currently in Web2 that are beginning to be overlapping with Web3. And I think this reconciliation process is what we're actually trying to envision as what is our North Star. You know? How do you actually reconcile connecting with consumers? Because every company has a marketing platform. They all have strategy. They know their communities, but they want to communicate with them better. The, the question that we're trying to address is how do we do it bringing these values of Web3 but without actually becoming overly polarized in that debate, no? Allowing a space for all. That would be a, our North Star. Interesting. Uh, before, uh, and anybody can jump in, but I want to kind of like centralize, <laughs> centralize the conversation in the sense that like a lot of you, we, 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 all of you spoke some way about identity, okay? And so I'll, I'll relate it to a problem that I see with a project that I have, we, we have right now, it's gonna be discussed later, but I'm sure a lot of groups have this have this problem, uh, whether it be a, a game, uh, a collection, uh, a, a platform, whatever. So, you know, essentially right now, I as a, I as a single person can make a million wallets. Okay, I can make a, I can make a million transactions, and they all come from different locations and so forth. And there's like, how are you? So it's for us, we go, we can skew that data. We can go, like, oh man, we have a million users, but it's like ten people doing thousand transactions, right? That's not bad, that's terrible math, I'm wrong. But you know what I mean. So how are you guys looking at that, that kind of influx of problems of, because it's so open, I can just kind of create all this data as a, 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 and like duplicate my own identity with sub-identities and so forth, versus like trying to keep it to one identity, one wallet, one person, and really having, I would think, through technology, a really enriched in experience if you really just one identity, that, that makes sense. That, does he understand the question? Please, uh, go ahead. Make, makes total sense. Yeah. Um, so I, I think this, uh, you have to go back to the physical world again um, uh, to understand uh, how the solution works. So basically, um, uh, you could have a million signatures. You just have to train them, right? But this doesn't make you a million identities. Identity is more than a signature. Identity is signature plus credentials. So if you go to, uh, 
10 services. One service says, yeah, th I can confirm this is, that this is your email address. Next service says, I confirm that this is your, don't know, Schwitter account. Um, next service says, um, I confirm that you are invested in this company. Uh, next service says, and so on and so on and so on. And then maybe government or a big company comes and says, I actually checked that this person also has a passport from this country and gives you a credential for that. And you collect all those credentials and they're all um, connected to this one single signature. Then this signature becomes the identifier which controls your identity. So this is already solved. So this, 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 this is the good news. So uh, <laughs> you can do that already. Go ahead. You want to add, Bruce? So um, I think it's uh, the question was millions of identities. So you can essentially dox, or not dox, but you can simple Club. attack. Yeah. Uh, a, a or, or, or just, just or make a, a second account. Identity. Yeah. So uh, as humans, we have different identities actually in different situations. Work, home, maybe you do ballroom dancing, maybe you do something else. And in each of those environments, you're a different person in some ways. And I think that one of the fundamental aspects of blockchain is that give, blockchain gives you the control and the choice to be one identity for all that or different identities depending on the need and your comfort level. And so that is, I think, a fundamental value of what blockchain does from the very start. It's, it's pseudonymity from the outset, and then on top of that, you can layer a specific person, a name, a screen name, you know, a, a board ape, whatever you want on top of that, and that allows you then to monetize based on that. Now, if you do become, let's say, an influencer, you want to concentrate that power of identity into one kind of avatar, and then you can monetize it in a much better way. So. Uh, just because we have millions of identities doesn't mean that reputation is um, infinite. Reputation is limited, identity can be infinite, and where people can build up value in the reputation, that's where other people are going to start trusting you. Whereas, of course, you know, if you have a Twitter profile with uh, five followers and stuff like that, people will place very, very little value on that identity. Real, can you repeat that statement about reputation again? So rep reputation is uh, essential. It's imbued value in a specific identity, right? Amazing. Yeah, Melanie? Well, uh, for me, the question is, uh, have you already seen some great UI UX um, in actual use cases where you can have this choice um, of yeah, deciding what kind of data you want to share, how can you really own the data? Because at the end, this has created the tremendous value on all these social networks that were, had silo databases, and they knew how to monetize these databases. But for me, the question is currently really, where can we see these amazing use cases of this new privacy that is promised? Uh, through Web3. I don't want to show my own project. We already have that, of course, but um, the, I think it's, not the, it's, it's actually not the UI that we're talking about. The thing is with digital identity, uh, you get more power, right? You get more power than with Facebook. Facebook has a nice interface, but you have no power at all. If you want more power, then you also have to have more responsibility. And I think this is the big issue because when, any type of blockchain-based identity that you want to have, will always come in some kind of a wallet, which means that you have to write down 12 words and please don't throw the piece of paper away. So if you throw this piece of paper away, then you have to start creating your identity over again, which is basically like you take your wallet and throw it in a trash can or something like that, accidentally. So then you have, you know what then happens. You have to go to all those public offices and, and, and so on and regain your identity by asking, so I'm actually this person, can you give me this thing again? So uh, you shouldn't throw away your 12 words. So we're not getting away from the 12 words. You have more responsibility because when you own your identity, then there's no button where you can click restore and there's no helpline where you can call and say, oh, can I please have my identity now? It's your responsibility. So this is actually the problem. Making it nice and shiny, um, I think, yeah, that's pretty easy, and I think we did this already. And, so. and, and I would take it a little bit further. I think we have to split the debate 
because we have to split the debate on what's the legal identity or the ramifications that go uh, alongside a KYC or what you actually have to validate, which what I think blockchain is a great tool that allowed the door to open. But I think the larger discussion is the right to actually represent yourself in a matter that you identify with. It does not necessarily need to be validated on the blockchain. It's just this right to actually be able to manifest what you believe it's your persona, whether it's in scenario A or B or C, and be actually recognized by, let's call the centralized or institutional authority as it be. Saying, if I am a global Fortune 500 company and I wanna hire a developer, and he does not want to reveal his identity as what he considers to be his true identity, it might be his crypto punk, no? How do I respect his rights to actually portray that image that reflects his persona with actually having the compliance and the regulatory uh, assurances in the liability perspective that I am complying with my regulatory framework? That reconciliation is something that has to happen and it's, it's a debate that will evolve naturally because now we're talking about our, not only our right to privacy, but our right to choose to not be labeled or to actually be labeled how we want to. And I think it far exceeds a traditional profile picture or a blockchain uh, right now profile. I think it just opened the door to this new debate on identity, no? I think, I think there's, a, uh, there, there's a naming problem uh, because uh, what you said is uh, the officially issued identity and you call that ID. So I think, I don't know what ID stands for, maybe identification card or something, but this is not identity. So if someone gives me a piece of plastic, it's not my identity, I'm sorry. My identity is much more than this piece of plastic. This piece of plastic is a credential which adds to my identity. And just so, uh, allow me to just do a caveat there because it's very interesting how we actually, how, how we actually are very conformist in this sense because when we are born, our identity, at least from a very institutional perspective, is derived from a registration card that is actually embedded in a system which you don't control, which actually dictates pretty much where you're born, pretty no. much determines no, no, a lot no, of no, your no, future. No, uh, I think that's the, the problem of your, your perception for identity. Yep. This is not identity, this is a credential. When I'm born, I already have a face, I already have a fingerprint, I may not have a signature. Um, but I, But this, uh, this is the root of my identity. This card which I get from the government just has a picture of this face on. So it is linked to that and I control, in the physical world, I control my identity. I can even go to another government and say, would you take me as your citizen? And then I get a new identity card. This identity card is just a credential and we have to think of identities as something that like Bruce says, you ha can have multiple. So this uh, maybe. Uh, you have a night identity and you have a day identity. You have a work identity and a game identity. You have all these identities. Maybe you don't want them to be mixed, right? And it's not about the ID card. The ID card is just a credential, and this credential can be digitized, and it can be stamped with, uh, from big companies with uh, very trusted stamps, and then you can use it in any transaction that you want, but it needs to be linked to you as a person, and you as a person is not... In, in the first way, a citizen. In the first way, it's a person. Um, fascinating, fascinating. And so I want to throw, bring it back and kind of flip it, the, the conversation, because I, I, this is obviously very complex. And I apologize because this question is going to seem very simple, all right? Um, we talked a lot about identity and connecting it to uh, both Web 2, Web 3 technologies, physical things, government-issued things, and all that. And one of the things that kind of on the reverse side is anonymity, right? Being anonymous, like, hey, I, I, these wallets that have all these big board dates and so forth, a lot, a lot of people, we don't, still don't know a lot of who these people are exactly. And, you, and Bruce, you talked about your platform, they believe in the beginning about like, the right to, to be anonymous or the right to be completely you know, free and docs and so forth. So I, I'm curious with, with all four of you, like what's your perspective on that? Because you know, when you have a big, NFT whale, big crypto whale. Oh, because they have a lot of power in that in that market. You know, and whether it's a coin, whether it's a collection, and because they're anonymous, it's kind of scary. Okay, and it, it's scary to everybody else who's in that collection, in that coin. It's scary to the entire market. But yet we're speaking to like you know having this 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 um, connected identity and, and 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 all this data to 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 the ID. So I'm curious, like, where you all stand in that kind of debate of like, hey, can we just let them be anonymous and just let them, you know, 
ebb and flow markets at the whim. Uh, and we cool with that. And go ahead, please, anybody. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll start with that. So but let's talk about something very topical, Celsius. Celsius hack, somebody published all the contributors there. Uh, we can even talk maybe three or four months ago when we had you know, all the liquidations happening from Three Arrows Capital and all that kind of stuff. Um, the unwinding of billions of dollars in leverage kind of uh, um, assets and stuff like that over the last six months has been very orderly and transparent. We haven't known the identity specifically of anybody who is involved necessarily, except for a, a few. But because of that, people are able, the market's able to adjust on that. So you don't need to know identities on that one. Now with the Celsius publishing of, of, of the complete database of the people who were affected by Celsius, that really doesn't affect anything. The, the, the value right now is that everybody has equal market information and transparency, which helps market function much better than the traditional world. And so I think that I would take it away from saying, you know, one whale is controlling everything. We have this in traditional world. It's just this intransparent. We know that there are billionaires who do a bunch of things behind the scenes to influence government, regulators, industries and such like that. In crypto space, you have the same stuff, except if you can see the wallets associated with whatever project or whatever uh, token, you can then adjust based on what that wallet is doing. You get more information on a broader level than what you do in the traditional world, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, I think just uh, we need to be careful that there is not a um, you know hypocrisy uh, here for um, what is anonymous and really privacy. And uh, on the other hand, we have now all the financial data on a public ledger. And uh, now we are even putting behavioral data on a public ledger with metadata, right? And so I'm currently actually being six years in this space now, uh, having a little bit of a Web3 fatigue, uh, I want to say, um, with, uh, with seeing uh, us promising privacy and us uh, in the Web3 space promising that, you know, this is so different to Web2. Um, but in Web2, we had our data only siloed with some companies, and obviously they monetized our data. But now there are all of these other companies already out there collecting data that is public on a public ledger and making sense out of it. And so uh, Board Ape or CryptoPunk or whatever asset, whatever wallet out there is soon potentially not private at all anymore. And so my question, this is why I love to be part of this panel, also to learn. <laughs> um, what features do we put in place? How important is privacy to us in the Web3 space? Versus, um, yeah, and, and how do we really create a UI UX that allows us to have the same privacy that we have with paper money? Where we, when we go to an ATM, we just take the money out and after this, no one should care anymore what we do with the money. Uh, and I think there are some steps similar to this that we need to implement where we clearly have the choice and at the same time a great UI UX that allows us this conscious decision about our privacy. Go ahead. I, I think when we started um, thinking about the Web3, the, the basic idea was that there were companies and those companies were basically uh, having too much power in the internet and we said, we need some essential things like payment and uh, identity and uh, data ownership. Th these things, we have to put them on protocol level and then everything will be fine. Uh, which, uh, so uh, putting them all on protocol level, so doing this uh, took much longer than we actually thought, or at least uh, how I actually thought. So uh, it was, it's all ideas from 2016, 2017, and they actually come to life this year and the year before. So uh, now the Web3 infrastructure is there. But of course, it was all built as a very, um, open infrastructure. So basically, when Ocean Protocol does a cool infrastructure, or we do a cool infrastructure, or Mel does a, does a cool infrastructure, then everyone can use that, right? So there's an application level on top of that. And if this application level is then collecting data again, we will not be able to do anything against it. So the question, uh, so Mel's question is extremely relevant. So who are actually the builders who use the 
totally open, totally um, privacy uh, preserving infrastructure to build something which is still privacy preserving? This is a very interesting question which will be answered in the next years because it couldn't be answered like three years ago because the infrastructure wasn't there. You can't build on something that's not there. Now the stuff is there and then the next year it will evolve, I think. I, the debate is very complex and it, it tends to polarize because, for example, the question you ask can be taken from the perspective of how you use the data. Are you actually abusing the data or do you give actually, if, or do you protect the data? But it, it also has to do, and I, for me at least, the pivotal issue is accountability, right? Uh, some of the worst atrocities are always committed when there is no actual accountability. And it's all good and fun until you start seeing a couple of the examples mentioned where third parties are being affected and then there being actual true uh, impacts to third parties or externalities and there's no accountability. And when you remove the accountability process, then it becomes a void and then there's no trust. So as I would see it is, Web3 is a beautiful revolution, right? It's a beautiful revolution that is setting tenets and covenants on which we can actually build. But revolutions are never actually meant to stay. They're, they're not constant. Revolutions are usually replaced by regime. And regime has to come with accountability. It has to come with certain rules of the game that allows us to play an even uh, playing field. And I think we are in this process of transitioning between the revolution and now meeting regime and accountability will play uh, a true important relevant game. And I think it's it's important to address it, oh, at least from, from that point. Amazing. We have time for a couple questions, hopefully, maybe one or two. Anybody have a question? No questions? Really? Okay. Just, just answer it all, apparently, these guys. All right. So, so I guess, like, going to the, going, expanding on the topic, the debate. So, where do you all stand on it? Like, like, and, and is, and is, it, is it up to us as individuals? to actually have a stance. Like, when you when you were just saying there, and you're like, oh, it, it's a bait, I'm like, I'm not sure if I even have a personal stance that I feel is fair. I just feel I have a selfish stance. That's just the thing that I want it to be, because I am me and the way I'd want to operate. But it's not fair to everybody else to just have it be the way I do it. So I'm curious, like, where is your stance on this kind of debate that we've just been discussing here? Uh, I think Web3's promise was not necessarily privacy. You, you can't have that with an open ledger. But it, well, the promise was pseudonymity and the ability to control your asset, whether it's digital money, digital identity, digital data. And that promise is still with us today. Now, we know that that on top of it, people are gonna start de like identifying, connecting, and stuff like that. Um, and I think that the main value so far is A, that promise is kept, and B, we have uh, technology that's being adopted globally across metaverse, gaming, data, money, et cetera, where everybody on Earth can participate. It's the one big technology that the entire world is now adopting at the same time. We haven't had that before. And that gives opportunity for a lot of people, and that also means a restructuring of the Web2 world, traditional finance, traditional businesses to move around this. And within that space, every single one of you has a chance to make your money, to contribute, to start owning your data, start owning your identity, and start taking more control over centralized, intransparent, big entities where we have no control over because they operate in a different country than where we live. Uh, and so I think that if we stick to that as the core, whether it's data, privacy, identity, or what have you, that we all have a a shot at getting value from this pretty amazing technology. No, for example, if you ask me, do I like to be taxed every time I trade my NFTs? Absolutely, I do not like to be taxed, no? But take it from a, from a privacy perspective. Obviously, when data gets used, right now we see the examples of data being sold, and then when data be, gets sold, you come into a secondary externality, which is discrimination through data, no? So as I see it, for example, in the world of blockchain, open ledger, decentralization, if I envision a world with a future where there is no actual privacy, where everything is on the open, 
then the question for me, or at least my stand, is how do I prevent from the discrimination of that access of information? How do I prevent an employer from actually discriminating the fact that they have all the access to my healthcare data, or that they know my, my, my genetic uh, predispositions for an illness? How do I prevent that from happening? So the debate for me at least is not should I hyper-regulate privacy, is how do I prevent the discrimination no, from, or, or at least how do I protect me as a citizen from this access of data? All right, I think we have to wrap up. So before we go, can you please each of you shout out uh, where we can find you online or if you have a, an exhibit here that, we, that the visitors can go. Uh, oh, let's ladies first, please. Yeah, uh, I'm hanging out here at TD5 at their pavillon. Uh, we have a little booth for one of our apps, Bulls, but you find me on LinkedIn, uh, Melanie Moore, Warm Protocol, warmprotocol.io. Thank you. For me, LinkedIn is the best way as well. Direct name, a doxed, and it, obviously we have it, Sabiel5 as well, uh, stand for R. Donnelly. Uh, you find all our channels on kilt.io, kilt like the German, uh, like the German, like the Scottish skirt, and uh, IO like IO. And if you want to see us in person, we are hanging around at the uh, Cypher Capital uh, booth, which is just around the corner. Chris, cool. We're, we're also right over there at Cypher Capital uh, booth. Uh, thank you very much. All right, let's give a round of applause to our amazing panelists. Let's bring up the next level of programs. Oh, Oscar, thank you. you want to see? Thank you very much. I'd now like to introduce our <clears throat> main partner, TD5. Rishab Gupta will be leading this TD5 panel with uh, their companies. They have the uh, <clears throat> The fin FinTech Blockchain Exclusive Lounge for um, investors that I hope you can also visit in their space just outside. Take it over. Thank you. 